hard to address, I was proud of them, uh, by a Chinese woman named Jacqueline Lee uh, called the Tibet in Agony, or the Agony of Tibet, I, I keep forgetting exactly which, in which is about the 1959 so-called uprising in Lhasa, which she, she, for the first time she tells the true story of that. And I didn't even know it really clearly myself, and I, uh, but she told it very clearly with all kinds of memos from Mao and Dong and all this kind of thing. And then um, she has tremendous data of Amdo, where Gela comes from, of the huge killing that went on in Amdo, uh, from Chinese secret police reports, it was. So well, what is that noise? You just made a noise, Justin. So, um, so Gela, had he been some sort of an official thing from before, long before, it would have been very difficult. So he came from a, a humble family of nomads, but sort of well recognized for a number of important spiritual scholars in their past. And actually one of the most famous Tibetan poets, oh, there's Gela. Famous Tibetan poets is a brother of Gela's, Chen Aksan, who wrote, um, <coughs> What's his other name again? I forgot. He wrote a number of poems that have been translated in English. And, um, and also later, in, in the 80s, the people in Amdo, because they were considered part of inner Tibet and not what the Chinese communists think that it was Tibet, the two-fifths of the country, uh, they, were, they had more minority schools. They have, were allowed to learn stuff in their language after, during the sort of relaxation period in the 80s. And then there was a sort of attempt to be more relaxed with them all. So then there are a lot of great Andos. The Andos are really. Actually, I brought today, I wear it again last honor, but I didn't get around to changing it. I brought a special shirt that I got. The Amdo Cafe. <laughs> the Amdo Cafe. Amdo Cafe. You know, I used to be, I was like an honorary Amdo by many Tibetans three years ago. So I don't, I don't know, Gela, you were never proclaimed uh, Toku, right? Which was lucky, I was telling you that was lucky for you because you might have been arrested if you had been a, toku, a formal Toku. Which doesn't mean you're not a Toku, but you, you weren't formally recognized as such, right? And uh, you're like a temple target. We had one geisha who worked with many of my students and colleagues who came to America in the 70s and 80s, and then he passed away in the noughts. No, even 2013, I think, after the noughts. The teens. And he was very, very skilled and capable, a great teacher, and beloved by his students. So they asked him, they said, Gela, you're so great, Geshe-la, you're so great. How come you're not a toku, the uh, official reincarnation? And he said, well, he said, I always wanted to be, but all the good ones were taken. <laughs> in other words, all the famous people in the past, somebody else was like nominated, <laughs> which, which is all silly because actually, the, the Buddha never, Buddhas never leave. They don't go away. They will leave a particular body to teach impermanence to people and how precious their humanoid body is. So Siddhartha body, which became Shakyamuni Buddha, then he said, okay, I'm, I'm finished now, I'm leaving. Just after telling his main disciple, Shariputra, oh, I mean, some months after that, you know, I could stay in like a thousand years if I want to, because by a Buddhahood, you don't have, a, it's a sci-fi thing, you don't have an ordinary body. You know, you have this magic body. Actually, people, even in this translation, they're calling illusory body. I never call it illusory body. Maya Deha, it's, a yulu. it's called in Tibetan, Maya Deha. But the word Maya, which is, means illusion, so it's not wrong, but it's a little rude. Illusory means like something not quite real. But magic body, the word also Maya means magic. So Buddha's mother's name was Maya Devi, magic goddess, that means. The magic we has a little bit positive connotation usually, right? We like, you know, oh, magic, oh, that's magical, we say. So it's really magic body. That, that once you're a Buddha, you have a magic body. So they never leave, A. B, Chukhu, which means Nirmanakaya, body of emanation. Do you know about the three bodies of Buddha? Does everybody know about a full-fledged Buddha in Mahayana has what's called three bodies? And sometimes four, I mean, they have different ways, but 
Uh, Usually three. Do you know, does everyone know that? No. no? I know two. Well, the, there's the reality body, which is everything, right? That's the main, that's the real one. That's the ultimate one. That's the nirvanic one. That's the bliss, void, indivisible one, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, right? But then, uh, just to sort of deal with the paradox of things, there's said to be what's called a material body or a form body. Usually people translate as form, but I think that's really not so good because it means what's some substance body, you know, material body. And then that has two types. One of them is called Sambhogakaya, which means the enjoyment body or the, the total enjoyment <coughs> body, the, the uh, longje dopiku the complete enjoyment body, like bliss, body of pure bliss, which is not visible to beings unless they are close to that state. You know, they're like high bodhisattvas, 10th stage or something. So it doesn't help regular beings like me, uh, because I can't see it, you know. Uh, so then he has nirmanakaya, which is called body of emanation. And body of emanation is there to interact with all the beings. And that's what tulku is, the translation of that word, tulku. Trill means a magical emanation, or again, has a slightly idea of illusory emanation. And, um, and that is as many as beings need. There's no limit. So for example, I used to translate for uh, different lamas, but particularly one who lived with us for quite a while, who was the abbot of, uh, former abbot of the Tantric College, Taratoku, marvelous man. And um, in inter-religious dialogues, you know, and he would always get into it with these Christian theologians. Your God is omnipotent, right? Yes. He can do whatever he wants then, right? Yes. How come he only had one son? <laughs> and then there's the right elaborate kind of, you know, theological reasons are given. And then he would say to that person, well, how many children do you have? Oh, I have four. <laughs> I remember particularly one Lutheran minister. Oh, I have four. You have four, but omnipotent God can only have one. You know, well, and then more theological reasons. And then and they went on and all tried all kinds of ways to could he could he have had a son, for example, yes, could he have had a son or daughter that would be in some other country or culture that nobody would ever heard of in the Middle East? Could he have done that? No, no, he would never have done that because this one son took care of the whole problem. But, but those people don't know about him, right? And then you say to people who don't know about him, they're doomed to hell anyway, even however holy they were, however great. Yes. Well, uh, how, you know, so he would get stumped like that. So finally, at the end of it, he says to me in Tibetan, Oh, well, he said, I guess the old boy only had one bullet in him. <laughs> <laughs> Referring to the omnipotent God. So then I burst out laughing, of course. He said it in Tibetan, right? So then my, then I, my face turned red because the, the theologian was like, what did he say? What did he say? <laughs> and I had to think of something. I thought that the joke might be a little much. So, uh, well, he just said that it's really fascinating, all kinds of ideas. But then, and then I explained, went on to explain that the, the Buddhists feel, even though they don't say Buddha is omnipotent, they never say that. But I think nowadays I use the word you know, omnicompetent. You know, is capable of doing whatever needs to be done, sort of thing. So omnicompetent, you know, like is can't just do everything for everybody, but is very competent in interacting with what people are doing to help it be successful. So, so therefore, this incarnation thing. He asked a question like, "Were you an official incarnation?" And I said, "I consider you officially an incarnation." That's what I, I recognize. And this, this, you talk, Yandeng Gompo, the junior, junior, and I, because you talk, and by the way, the Italians owe the Tibetans huge royalty over a thousand years, or more, no, 600 years royalty, because the Tibetans invented pasta. <laughs> Did you guys know that? I bet you didn't. You just think Tibet is some weird thing, a bunch of weirdos. They invented pasta. We thought Actually, it was, it was in Amdo, where Genla comes from. <laughs> so they invented pasta, as acknowledged by Chinese archaeologists, and everyone else agrees. And why? You can't bake at altitude. To make up, I, I saved somebody's life once. 
by trying to bake a pizza at about 8,000 feet in Dalhousie. <laughs> and it took so long that they didn't have, we didn't have dinner till 10 p.m. They came at 5.30. And then they went home, didn't get home till 11.30. And uh, when they got home, a giant boulder, it was a rainy season, it went down and crushed their living room and house, you know, that they lived in, that little hut that they lived in. They would have been killed sitting where they usually sit from this huge boulder. So I really know that it takes a really lot of fuel and a long time to bake anything at altitude. So pasta, you boil it. You know, you make a, you add an egg or a butter or a border and you knead it and then you boil it. And that's why it was invented at altitude pasta. So this, so Marco Polo Incorporated owes a lot of money to the Tibetans. <laughs> tremendous amount of money. <laughs>